welcome from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational church at the crossroads of life. We bring you portions of the Sunday morning service from our beautiful sanctuary at 303 South Peck Avenue in the community of Manhattan Beach. We are glad you are joining us for this special service, and we hope it will be a source of inspiration and direction for you in the days ahead. We also invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday morning or any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. For more information about the church and its wide-ranging programs, please feel free to contact the church office at 310-372-3587. And now, our Sunday morning service. a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the wood sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. Heavenly Father, we come before you in a country formed by many nations, in a congregation formed by a diverse people, joined together here to worship you. Be with us this day and unite our nations and our peoples in your saving grace, which we seek in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Um, this is the first Sunday of our summer season, so um, the
Father's Day, so happy Father's Day. Uh, my father's coming up. Um, we're going to have dinner together, he and my mom. Um, I'm from Arcadia, so I'm from Southern California. So on a Sunday, the chasm between here and Arcadia, called downtown LA, is not quite so great as it is on a normal day to get down here. So they're going to make the trip. Um, I also wanted to let you know, they're, they're going to be driving me to the airport tonight. Um, I don't know how many of you know that I'm going to be leaving for two weeks. I'll be coming back. For some, that's good news. For some, that maybe not is such good news. Um, I'm going to be going to not only our general synod for our denomination uh, and representing us there, but I'm also taking a polity class. As many of you know, I'm sort of coming in sideways uh, to this denomination to get ordained. And hopefully next spring, you all will be able to be here while I'm ordained, uh, which will be a wonderful service. And I'll be really excited uh, to for have you all a part of that as our family here. Um, and so I need to take a class learning about polity. Now, John jokes that he could have given me the class in two hours. Uh, apparently, though, it takes two weeks. And um, Dave Lindsay, who you all know, assures me the class is a lot of fun. And I've already contacted a lot of people involved in the class. And I'm excited to meet fellow youth pastors in the UCC and to meet kind of fellow ministers and kind of see what the wider UCC is all about. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that brings me to Grand Rapids, Michigan which I've never been to before. I hear it's wonderful. I have a friend that lives out that way, so I get to have lunch with her and uh, meet some of the other youth pastors that are in that area. Um, so pray for me for the next two weeks uh, that, I, that I learn all that God wants me to learn, and I'll come back and um, give a report to you all. So that's where I'll be for two weeks. I'm missing um, our rehearsals for Godspell. I hope that you all can come. Um, Matt is doing a great job with Godspell, kind of doing a kind of creative element with it. And then Nancy Stark, of course, is uh, also producing it, who, as you all know, is very talented. Um, so I'm just excited that that's all going to be happening. And when I come back, I look forward to seeing all the progress that's been made. Uh, so we hope that you do that. We're probably also going to be this summer sometime having the youth come in and sing one of the songs for you. So look for that. That's going to be exciting. Um, I also wanted, uh, I thought it was really awesome. I didn't get the memo for um, Hawaiian shirts. Uh, just FYI. Um, I don't have one, so maybe the memo wouldn't have helped anyway. But I want you to notice uh, that Reverend Ray's has... Um, Elements of In-N-Out Burger on it, which I thought was <laughs> distracted me a bit while they were singing, I'm just saying. Take a look at it. Fascinating. Fascinating. I guess I could have worn my In-N-Out shirt, but that, that seemed a little bit um, casual for the day. So, um, uh, My sermon is entitled, The Eyes Have It, as in eyes. I hope you got that pun a little bit. Um, I thought I would get out in the open, in my first couple sermons, all of my weird quirks just so you weren't surprised later. So we've talked about my feet, right, pedicures. Uh, if you were at the Easter morning service, I talked about my bunnies, right, and how I love bunnies. Um, and so now I thought I would share my weird sort of eye phobias. Um, I don't know about you, but I think eyes are very delicate. So you shouldn't touch them. Uh, you shouldn't poke around with them. Um, lasers shouldn't come near them. What's with laser eye surgery? I'm really thankful that I have decent eyesight because I don't need to wear contacts. 
um, and I don't need to wear glasses at this point. Um, I can tell you that my last eye doctor appointment ended uh, with the doctor telling me, you're probably going to faint, you need to put your head between your legs, and I'm going to run and get you some water. So I'm sure that I made quite an impression with the eye doctor who has great stories to tell his other colleagues. Um, I don't think you should touch your eyes. <laughs> I don't, I, you know when kids do that thing where they flip up their eyes? Come on guys, you know, you've done it. You flip your eye lid up, you think it's really funny and you run at me, ah. Um, I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny, just to let you know. Uh, did anyone see the movie Minority Report? Uh, with Tom Cruise. Um, not that I'm a fan of his per se. I'm just saying the movie shocked me a bit because in the movie it's futuristic and when you walk into stores like Gap, there's a future gap in the movie, it's set in the future, um, it, it scans your eyes and your retina and then says, did you like those Gap pants you ordered, Aaron? Can you get, you know, and so he had to like, in the movie he's hiding from the law because he is the law. It's, I don't, I'm not going to go the whole story. Uh, but he has to have his eyes taken out so that he can hide from the law. But he needs his eyes to get in places so he carries them around in a plastic bag. I did not enjoy this. I did not enjoy this and I was not prepared. So in the future, if, if you know I'm gonna see a movie and there are any mention of eyeballs, just let me know as a courtesy, I'm just saying. Um, I found it very, very difficult. And recently there was like a horror movie I never saw where all the posters were everywhere and there was like a hand coming out of an eye. Did you see that? Like the eye, I think it maybe was called the eye. Very creative. And I couldn't even look at the poster. But I have issues with eyes because I think um, eyes are very important. You need to see with them. And we have a lot of wonderful sayings with eyes. Eyes are the window to the soul. God talks a lot about eyes and eyes seeing and eyes, eyes, you know, when we look with our eyes, uh, wonderful things happen. Um, and I brought me to my favorite quote. Um, it's, it's from a French author and it goes like this. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And that always struck me because while I've talked up here about my love of travel and many of us love to travel, um, whenever you travel somewhere, you take yourself with you, right? And so sometimes uh, learning about new things also is a matter of having new eyes or in other words, changing your perspective. I had a friend who got married to a wonderful guy. Um, I don't know if you know people who generally are unhappy a lot. Do you know people like that? They kind of complain about things. He took her to Paris and when they came back I'm like, how was Paris? I love Paris. I've been there a couple times. How was Paris? It must have been wonderful. They stayed in a nice hotel. And she said, oh, it was okay. And I was like, next time have him take me. Because that sounded like a fun trip. And she proceeded to complain about the entire thing. And I thought, gosh, it wasn't enough for her to get on a plane and go to Paris. But she needed to have different eyes to enjoy it and experience it. Uh, when I was in Rome, um, I was by myself in a hotel, wonderful hotel, had a lot of fun, went and saw another Tom Cruise movie. Sorry, I'm not trying to make Tom Cruise the focus of the sermon, but I came back to my hotel and everyone's sitting outside the front of the hotel because the power had gone out. It was the summer, the air conditioning's on. And my first thought was, oh, the power's out. And my second thought was, but the power's out in Rome. Right? Still cool. I'm in Rome. I mean, at home, that's a bummer. But when you're in Rome, it's still kind of cool. It's a good story for later. I got to meet all of my uh, fellow people in my hotel, right? We're all sitting down on the steps waiting for the power to go back on, and it did shortly. And I still thought it was kind of a fun, cool adventure. And so it's not enough to, for me to go to Rome, but to see it in that new way and have those new eyes. Um, I was reminded also of that. How many saw The Wizard of Oz? We had a great cast. I saw, I had to see, but I did want to see both casts, so I could say I'd seen all the kids' casts. Um, and I think I love the story of Dorothy for multiple reasons, but for the main reason is that for her, it's a journey of discovery. I was reminded of that when McKenna, uh, who was Glenda the Good Witch, reminded Dorothy that she needed to remember that home was a wonderful place to be. And not that we should never leave home, that certainly isn't what I take out of it. But that she needed to see her home and her family with new eyes. 
in a new way. She needed to appreciate them in a new way. And today is Father's Day. Um, I know for some of us that isn't our favorite day for whatever reason, but if you have a father who has been wonderful, please take an opportunity to really look and see with new eyes and appreciation your fathers. Um, what I wanted to focus on today is a little known story in the Old Testament, the story of Hagar, the insignificant slave girl. Uh, when I was telling people about this, because I get so excited, it's one of my favorite stories actually, uh, people are like, is that a cartoon character? Um, I don't know what that is. Um, Hagar is the slave girl to Sarah and Abraham. Um, and when Sarah is given the promise from God that she will have children, it doesn't happen right away. So she takes this slave girl and she sends her in to her husband. We can infer that, what that means. And Hagar becomes pregnant. Now, I know for us, in our individualistic, more modern society, we have no idea what's going on. But for that time period, it was very common for slaves to not even have rights over their own bodies. They were property. She was probably of another ethnicity. She certainly was of another social standing. She was invisible to her culture. She was nothing. So go in. Do my bidding. And she gets pregnant. And then she gets a little full of herself, right? I'm doing this great thing, this wonderful thing. And um, it's shocking to think that this story has survived through oral tradition in a sort of patriarchal society, survived this heroic woman. And this is what happens in Genesis 16. I'm going to read it. The angel of the Lord, which is just a fancy way to say the presence of God, found Hagar, because she ran away, near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. We, we say that only so we get historical narrative. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarah, Hagar answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Then there's a description of Ishmael for another sermon. And then <laughs> she says, she calls the name of the Lord, the Lord who spoke to her. She says, you, God, are the one who sees me. Let me say that again. You, God, are the one who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. God sees her in her pain as she runs away from a horrible situation. God sees her and doesn't see her label, servant, slave. He sees her in her pain. As we sang today, the first hymn, it talks about that as well. God seeing us in the midst of our lives. Even in the mundane, even in the pain, God sees us. Uh, there's a book called The Lost Women of the Bible. Of course, I would have that book in my repertoire. I highly recommend it. And the author says this about Hagar. Hagar's next two actions reveal what real theology is about. First, Hagar does the unthinkable. She gives God a name to his face. No one else in scripture, male or female, ever names God. Hagar does. She names him El Roy, the Hebrew term for the God who sees me. The new name she gives to God expresses her most basic theological conviction. She is not invisible to God. Second, Hagar lived out her theology, took it with her to the hardest place of all. Knowing God's eye was upon her, emboldened her to do the impossible. She returned to Sarah, the woman most feared and who'd grievously wronged her. After years of slavery, Hagar's return to Sarah was probably the first truly free act of her life. Sarah thought she needed Hagar to secure a baby for her husband, but she couldn't have been more wrong. Hagar has something Sarah needs even more than a child. She has the message, I would say the gospel message, that God's eyes are on Sarah too. God wasn't angry at Sarah's disobedience. 
even though we herald Abraham and Sarah as the first family of several faiths, but of our faith too, he runs after her, he chases after her, and she gets the privilege of interacting with God and having that story handed down. God saw Hagar, and it was powerful. He didn't label her as a lost cause or not worth it or... He looked past her labels and saw her and her need. I was always mad, I have to admit, at God for sending her back to Sarah. You know, I thought, why? But it's a lesson for us, too, don't you think? That even in troubled times, God doesn't always fix our circumstances. But what he wants is to fix our eyes and how we see our circumstances. And keep in mind, it's not as if there was slave recovery programs or college or, you know, any kind of program that would have helped her out. There really in that culture was nothing else for Hagar to do but be a slave. But God gives her the choice to go back and empowers her and gives her a promise of multiple descendants. And also, I think... God knew that in the very next chapter, he was going to bless Abraham and Sarah, and he wanted Hagar to be a part of that. As much as Abraham and Sarah may not have deserved it, they got it. And aren't we often that way, too? We don't deserve it, but we get it, that blessing. Um, in our Bible discussion group, we're going through the book of Mark. And um, I think I'm hoping that one of the things the kids see over and over again in Mark is that Jesus is someone who sees people. Jesus doesn't pass people by. You realize in the culture of the first century, when Jesus roamed the earth and taught and preached and, and saved people, <laughs> physically, often, we wonder, why did God, why did, why did God through Jesus, why did he, you know, uh, fix people, heal people? What was that all about? Well, you need to understand in that culture, someone that was unhealthy or poor or outcast was seen as a lost cause, was seen as unfixable. God must not like you. I'm not going to touch that person that has leprosy. God may not like that person. And Jesus turns that on its head, doesn't he? He touches that person with leprosy. He heals that blind person. Because in that, Jesus is saying, God sees you. God sees you in your pain and in your circumstances and whatever label he makes a Samaritan a hero of a story. I know we think of that as normal, but they would have seen it as radical. That person, a hero, they're not loved by God. And Jesus challenges that. Where, where we would see a fisherman, a tax collector, Jesus sees friends and disciples. He looks past those labels. He sees people in pain. And in the idea of having a clear vision of new eyes, um, Jesus talks about eyes a bit. In Matthew 7, he talks about how we see people clearly. He says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Again, with my eye phobia, we have to, you know, think through that a little bit. Verse 5, skipping. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice that Jesus is a realist. He's not having fanciful thinking. He realizes there are specks. He doesn't say there won't be specks. Oh, no, we got specks, right? We got specks in our eyes. But he says, so I'm not talking about name it and claim it or wishful thinking or, you know, no one has any problems. Um, it's not about closing your eyes to reality for Jesus or for God. It's about opening our eyes to the truths that some things need to be seen in a different way. Has anyone ever um, been apartment hunting or, you know, house shopping? I did that before I came here and I moved to El Segundo in the end of January. It was quick, two weeks. And for those two weeks, I saw, you know, I was about to say millions. That's not true. <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> God, exaggerate him here. Uh, hundreds of for, for rent signs everywhere. Every apartment was for rent because that was all I was looking for. I don't think I've seen a for rent sign in months. Does it mean they don't exist? It means I'm not really 
looking, am I? I have different eyes now. I'm looking for different things. Um, I have friend, a friend, uh, my best friend got pregnant. She's had two kids. And I've been told that when you're pregnant or you first have kids, all you see is kids, right? All of a sudden, everyone has kids. Being single sometimes, most of the time I enjoy it. Sometimes when I don't, everyone's a couple. Everyone's a couple. Oh, my goodness. Because I'm looking with those eyes. That's what we're talking about. Not that reality changes, but that our perspective changes, our focus changes. Um, and I think if we're honest, we would say that sometimes our viewing and our vision gets stuck in a rut. We let our past or the perceptions of our past or people, we categorize them and we don't release that, do we? Our eyes and our vision get stuck in a certain way of seeing, looking at a certain thing. Because it would be silly for me to keep looking for for rent signs, right? I signed a lease. I'm not getting out of it, right? So I don't need to really look at for rent signs. It'd be weird. And sometimes we do that still, don't we? We keep our vision in that rut. We don't give people the benefit of the doubt in the way Jesus did or the way God did with Hagar. We, we don't see people past the labels. They're not savable. They wronged me. They're not nice. And maybe it's something that happened so long ago we can't even remember what it was. But we see them through that lens. It's the log and spec mentality, I call it. This is what Jesus is saying. That the log and my brother and sister's eye should look like a speck from my perspective. My perspective. And the speck that is in my eye should look like a log from my own perspective. Imagine if we came to conflict in that way, seeing ourselves as the one who has done wrong. Because we have. None of us are perfect. And having that change of perspective gives us grace to see people beyond the categories. And I think what Jesus is also saying is that log is so big it gets in the way of us really seeing people. Again, I'm getting a little grossed out by my own analogy, the log and the eye. It's funny, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not subtle, Jesus. And I think that because we see God as a God who sees, really sees people, that we in turn need to be people who not only are seen by God and acknowledge that, but who see other people really see them. We don't often get to choose our families, but we can choose how we see them. We don't often get to choose our coworkers or our neighbors, and unfortunately for some, we don't get to choose who comes to our church. I'm kidding. I love you all. Um, I do. I've met wonderful people. But we don't get to choose that necessarily. But we do get to choose how we see them. Do you see the distinction? We get to choose the eyes that we have that view people. With God and Hagar, God saw beyond her label. She was not valuable, but not unlike that little seashell I held up, was of immeasurable value to God. Her culture said she was nothing. Her owner said she was nothing. And God chased after her and said, you are valuable. And I want us to hear that for us. When we're in pain and in trouble and in struggle, that God sees us. He won't always change our circumstances, and I don't know the answer to why, but he sees us. And that we need to be people challenged by that to see other people to see people how God sees people, with hope and grace and forgiveness and mercy. And I think the log and speck shows a little bit of humility. We need to see people, really see them. Not just their label or what we think of them or our perceptions or what someone's told us of them. We need to really see people. Remember, we like Hagar, are called by a God who sees us. We can call God the one who sees. Remember, the littlest people 
not unlike the littlest seashell, is of an indescribable, incandescent value to God. And I hope you hear that today, that not only are you incredibly valuable to God, enough to chase after, that the people around you are also indescribably valuable too. Amen. We are pleased that you have joined us for the Sunday morning service from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational congregation. We hope that the music and the spoken word have lifted your spirits 
and have offered guidance and a sense of direction for your life. Have a wonderful week.